Well, hey, we want to just take a moment and welcome you, church family, and those that are visiting with us today, and a special welcome to everyone that is joining us online as well. And uh, I would love for all of us just to welcome everyone that is joining us online by uh, giving them a round of applause. Uh, it is a, honestly, it's a joy. It is a joy to be able to gather together to participate in worship. Now, I use that word uh, participate because you're just not, you don't view worship. You're, you're just not, you're, you're not just uh, seeing worship displayed or demonstrated here on the stage. You are participating in worship. And when we come together as a church family, as a corporate body, we are participating actively in worship together. We are serving together. We are giving together. And we are most importantly posturing ourselves before the word of God because it is living and active and has the power to transform. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, I want to also just encourage you to mark your calendars for September 25th. It is a monumental Sunday morning. Actually, I, I believe every Sunday morning is a monumental Sunday morning because uh, we're able to gather and meet with God. Uh, but next, uh, in two Sundays, we are going to take time to celebrate both Pastor and Amy Jo and for their amazing years and a decade here at Turning Point. And so we want uh, to just take a moment to celebrate them. It's also going to be uh, the installment, my installment as your next lead pastor. Uh, we're also going to have, and this is probably the most important out of all of that morning, we are going to have some spectacular food uh, that we're going to be providing. And I kid you not, we were able to sample this food as a staff this last week, and my mouth is salivating just thinking about it. And uh, it's, it's great. We're going to do like these charcuterie boards out there in the atrium. It's going to be wonderful. We want you to come and to celebrate all of the things that God has done. Amen? Amen. So speaking of that, we are going to take a special uh, one-time offering for Pastor and Amy Jo that morning. You have the ability to be able to start giving towards that now. You can do that by going to your Turning Point app or giving online, or you can mark your giving envelopes. And just be really clear on this. It goes towards Pastor Monty and Amy Jo's uh, gift. If you're using the app or online, just go to Special Speaker Offering and all of that in entirety is going to go and bless them. Uh, and then just one really quick side note, uh, if you have a child, so if you have a grandchild, a child, uh, they're all a part of kids' life, I just want to say thank you so much for taking your kids to church. We believe that this is an uh, important season in their life to grow in the Word of God and to understand their relationship, their identity, and who they are in Jesus, especially as they move into youth group. I just want to let you know that there's one one slight change uh, to what we're doing down the kids' life room. Uh, actually, it's, it's a great change. Uh, we're going to be moving towards something called uh, Planning Center Online. It's our database that we're going to uh, eventually move towards, but it is a new check-in system. Just want you to be aware that launches next Sunday, so just be mindful of that. It's pretty slick. I've seen it run, and I almost had tears coming down. So uh, anyways, I'm just a systems guy, so I love Love all of that and especially love how it works really well. Okay, so we are in a two-part sermon series that I'm titling Vision Sundays. And so it'll happen today and next Sunday. My goal is to take you on a journey. Um, how many of you guys like to take journeys? Okay, adventures. Good. I love that. Okay. We are going to go on a journey today and next Sunday we're going to actually take time to focus on three important segments over the next two weeks. And here are these three important segments, two of which we're going to be talking about today. We're going to learn about lessons learned from the past. We're going to take a moment, and we have an amazing godly heritage, and we're going to just take a moment this morning to learn about those lessons from the past. The second one, we're going to have a reality check of our present. And then the third is a hopeful future. 
So you may find yourself drawn to a particular area, whether it's the past, the present, or the future. Some of you are, you just love history. You love going back and taking a look at that. That is your, one of your favorite segments. For some of you, you just live in the present. This is, you, you find great fulfillment in this area. Or for some of you, you are completely future oriented. And, but regardless of what you're drawn to, I do not want any of you checking out on any of these three important segments that we're gonna be discussing. I want, I believe, God is there, he's gonna to speak to us through these three important things, but I do want your heart and your mind fully engaged. And can I get a big amen? Amen, amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's just take a moment and uh, take a moment to pray and to invite God's spirit to speak to us this morning as we open up his word and allow it to transform our hearts. Father, we come before you and we are so thankful that your word is living and active. And God, we are so thankful that it has the power to transform the way we think and the way we live. Lord, we pray blessings upon this morning. God, I pray against any obstacles uh, that may be in the way of our heart transformation this morning. I pray against the distractions of uh, wanting to have lunch really soon or uh, the distractions of our Amazon or our Facebook or things that uh, may get in the way. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would center our hearts upon you this morning. And Lord, we are so thankful that you are at work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. The reason why I mention Amazon and Facebook is uh, I have a tech team up there and they watch you guys um, from down below. And I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That's, <laughs> that doesn't happen. So anyways, um, but uh, we are, we are really excited about this two-part sermon series. You, you have to understand that you cannot see clearly the future until you know where you have been and where you are. The goal of Vision Sundays is to give you a full picture, a full picture. So uh, to begin, we're gonna go ahead and hop into segment one, uh, lessons learned from the past. Proverbs 1.5 says this, let the wise listen. How many of you guys just need to listen? Okay, I need, I, I need that for myself. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get, let's all say it together, guidance. Let the discerning get guidance. So let's begin with the year 1933. There are several things that happened in this particular year. It was one of the worst during the Great Depression. Uh, strong winds had, had actually picked up and ripped up a ton of topsoil uh, from, from drought-affected farms in the Midwest, which created dust bowls. Uh, the repeal of prohibition in the United States was allowing for beer and wine sales to come through. The machine gun was demonstrated for the very first time by a Japanese, Japanese scientist. It was 1,000 rounds per minute that were shot, construction of the San Francisco Bridge had began. Albert Einstein had immigrated to the United States from Germany. Wiley Post becomes the first person um, to uh, go around the world flying solo in an airplane. The first drive-in movie theater opens up in New Jersey. So what also happened in the year 1933 was a group of men and women who gathered as believers on 411 West Indiana, where they would hold revival meetings, where these meetings, revival meetings were happening six days a week, and, and they called themselves Revival Center Tabernacle. And it was pastored under a man named W.E. Minald. And they brought in many, many people. Uh, to come to know the Lord, but using things like big band, uh, these orchestras. And it was a tool for gospel opportunities. Later on, this church became known as First Church of the Open Bible. 
So what are some lessons? What are some lessons that we have learned? Well, here's the number one lesson. They possessed grit. They possessed grit. Grit means that they had courage, resolve, and the strength of character. So this church was not birthed out of convenience, but rather out of desperation to see the gospel advance in Spokane City. Six days a week, meeting in a tent on West Indiana, where they got to see God's Spirit revive souls of men and women. And the church used whatever it had at the time to help bring people into the church to experience God. And so they used things like this, the orchestra, and I think you guys probably saw pictures already of the orchestra up there. Big band, but it was a tool at that time used by the Lord. A scripture that I would like uh, to just share with you that I believe encapsulates the hearts of these people is found in Romans chapter five, verses two through five. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. How many of you guys have run into problems or trials? For we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. It produces things in us. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know, uh, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to, to, to fill our hearts with his love. Sometime later in 1964, Pastor Norm Lelisher became senior pastor and served this church with, he served with this church with a tremendous amount of different qualities. But there are two in particular that I wanna emphasize. He, did, he served this church with passion and with integrity. Pastor Norm had so much passion for the word of God. I'll tell you this, towards Pastor Norm's final days, he uh, was struggling with dementia and memory loss issues. And so he would be, uh, Pastor Monty would bring him into our staff meetings and he didn't remember people's names. Um, but Pastor Monty would share just a quick situation, something that, that was going on in someone's life or in the life of our church, and it was challenging and difficult. And Pastor Norm, without skipping a beat, would say, this, would re this reminds me of a scripture. And he would quote that scripture word for word. He had the word of God deeply deeply held within his heart. So Pastor Norm and Norma pastored this church for 29 years. Under Pastor Norm and Norma's leadership was a building project, change towards new forms of ministry, and a strong influence in the Open Bible uh, Network, in the Open Bible Denomination, the, op uh, the Spokane community, and around the world. In 1979, Pastor Monty came on staff, um, and he had a lot of hair at the time, I hear. So, <laughs> he served as assistant pastor for 15 years. He served in that role, and then was elected as senior pastor in August of 1993. Under Pastor Monty and Amy's leadership was another building location that we have today, and that was difficult. And he shared that story many times, but it was a miracle. We had a name change to Turning Point Open Bible, expansion projects at Waits Lake Camp and more. Pastor Monty and Amy Jo have served this church faithfully, have led courageously, loved unconditionally, 
and adapt it towards different ministry models so the gospel would reach more people for Jesus. Some of these tools were things like dramas and master's commission, the implementation of our small group ministries. So, uh, so over the last 60 years, over the last 60 years, this church has seen thousands of people come to know Jesus, lives transformed through discipleship, and people of this church make a difference for the kingdom of God in extraordinary ways. So the lesson number two that we learn from our past is that we were full, excuse me, they were full of integrity and were surrendered to the Holy Spirit's leading. They were full of integrity and were surrendered to the Holy Spirit's leading. Over the past 60 years, we have seen adaptive leadership, willingness to experiment with new ministry concepts while remaining unswervingly committed to the mission that Jesus has for us. The discipleship of helping bring people closer into relationship with Jesus we have developed leaders that are now leading churches um, nationwide and around the world. And the integrity of leadership that unified people during some pretty difficult times. So if I were to summarize the last 60 years, it's, uh, it's found in Psalm 92. It says here, it is good to give thanks. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. There are two things that I just want to draw attention to in this particular section of scripture, steadfast love and faithfulness. The Lord has always, always loved this church and has always been steadfast and faithful with this church historically, even during some of the toughest times. Can I get a big amen? Yeah. Amen. The Lord has been tremendously faithful. So the past gives us so many lessons to learn. Lessons of God's faithfulness, his miracles, and his limitless grace upon this church. So it's important that we take time to learn. It's important to take time to reflect and to honor the past. But please understand my heart here. I do not want us living in the past. It's important that we continue to keep our eyes on what lies ahead. Ecclesiastes 7.10 says this, don't always be asking, where are the good old days? Wise folks don't ask questions like that. Another quote that I want to share with you it's an unknown author. They said that, that if your memories outweigh your dreams, the end is near. So it's absolutely important that we honor, we take time to reflect, we learn from the past, but we continue to assess our present and we keep our eyes on what lies ahead that the Lord has for us. Amen? Amen. So segment number two. The reality check of our present. First Chronicles 12.32 says this, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. So before we move into uh, the segment on future, we must be able to discern our present season that the Lord has us in. The tribe of Issachar, well, they, they discerned the signs of the times, and then they were able to, to create an action plan from that. So 
Understanding the signs of times, it is a complex and vast discussion. We could be here all day talking about the present check of the uh, a reality check of our present, but I thought it would be important to begin to highlight a few important areas. And I want you to also understand there's great hope. Despite the difficulties and the challenges that we see in our present, there is great hope because Jesus, well, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. So first, Christianity is spreading faster now than ever before in human history. Here are a few stats that I want to share with you that I think will just get your spirit jumping. There are nine, uh, excuse me, there were nine million Christians in Africa in the year 1900. By 2000, by the year 2000, there were 335 million believers, 37 times as many, with the most growth occurring in the 1960s. In Latin America, in 1900, there were 50,000 Protestants. Today, there are more than 64 million serving Jesus. Christians in Asia grew from 101 million to 351 million over the last 40 years, since 1970 to 2010. In China, it has been estimated that 10,000 people per day become Christ followers. And even by conservative estimates, Christianity has grown 4,300% in 50 years. And this I find really interesting. By 2030, China will have the most amount of Jesus followers in any country by 2030, which is pretty remarkable. Amen? I just think that's great. Okay, so in the Islamic world, there were no movements until the 19th century. Today, every region of the Muslim world is experiencing replicating movements, even in some of the most extreme areas. In terms of kingdom movements, so that includes things like church planting, discipleship, um, uh, a church uh, leadership replication. Of, and, and, but so, so in terms of kingdom movements, there are is an astonishing 651 movements that are happening globally. So people are coming to know Christ. They're developing leaders. Uh, they are creating church plants. These are 651 kingdom movements that are happening globally, but there are only eight happening in North America. Eight movements that are happening in North America alone. Now, there are many reasons for this. Secularization, prosperity, lack of a biblical worldview, deficiency of biblical literacy, lack of of a prayer emphasis, too much dependence upon self. The list can go on, but I do not want you to be discouraged, okay? Today, I don't want you to show up at church. We're talking about Vision Sunday, and you're leaving. Wow, that was the most discouraging message that Pastor Josh gave. But I do want us to discern our present. I do want us to have a reality check. I do not want us putting our heads in the sand and pretending that these things do not exist. But I am also hopeful because I believe that God is going to do something powerful in and through the American church. I believe that. And I believe that we are part of that solution. So don't be discouraged, but let's discern. And most importantly, continue to seek God for wisdom and keeping our eyes on him. So let's drill down on a few things in terms of our, our, our just a reality check of our present. Uh, and so we live, 
Washington State, I'm gonna drill, I'm gonna bring it back just a little closer. Washington State, we live in one of the uh, most unchurched states in the United States. Uh, we're part of what they call the unchurched belt. There's the Bible belt, and we are the antithesis of that. <laughs> We are the opposite of the Bible Belt. We are a part uh, of a group of states that are the most unchurched in the United States. This includes Oregon, no surprise there. Uh, Nevada, sorry, did I just say that out loud? If you are from Oregon, oh man, okay, forgive me. <laughs> oh goodness, Oregon, Nevada, and Alaska. And 47% of Washingtonians are considered religious nannies, okay? So they have nothing. Yeah, well, they call them nannies to it sometimes. So they, 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 they're just, uh, but they, they are religiously no connection to anything in terms of faith, 47%. So Spokane City is listed as the 23rd uh, city out of 117 cities as the most unchurched in the United States. 43% of the people in our Spokane city are unchurched, having no connection to Jesus or to religion. So, we have a lot of work ahead of us. The harvest is plentiful, okay? The harvest is plentiful. And please understand my heart on this. The Lord didn't call us to pray for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. It's out there. But he did call us to pray for the workers. Pray that workers would come. That's you and I. Those are Jesus' followers. So we, the harvest is plentiful. 43% of our Spokane community is far from God. That is a reality check. 47% in the United, or in, excuse me, in Washington State is far from God. That works out to 3.5 million people in Washington that have no connection to Christianity. We have young people, number two, excuse me, third one here. We have young people leaving the church at an unimaginable rate. 59% uh, of young people will disconnect either permanently or in, for an extended period of time from the church after the age of 15, Six, 59%, 60% of our young people. Man, so when I look at, when I go in on a Wednesday night into our youth group and I'm looking at all of our kids that are of the age 15 and older, I'm thinking to myself, 60% are going to disconnect from their faith. We have got to do something. There are a few reasons for this. Church seems overprotective. Christianity feels stifling. This is, this is a, a Barna's research, and this is a, essentially what they had heard and the feedback of those 60% that had disconnected from Christianity uh, either for a short period of time or for uh, indefinite. Stifling, fear-based, risk-averse. Christianity seems shallow. The Bible is not taught clearly or often enough. And this is, this is, what, this is what gets me. God seems, this is what their feedback is, God seems to be missing from my Sunday morning experience. How is that even possible? Are people coming in to a Sunday morning experience and they're missing God altogether? The church feels unfriendly to those who doubt, those who struggle with emotional problems, depression, or intellectual doubts about faith. We're gonna be talking next Sunday. I want you to certainly be here if you can. And, and if you know of another person that isn't here that should be here, invite them to come and be here as well. We're gonna be talking about what does this mean as a church family to continue to find strategies and God-given ways and tools to help reach our next generation. 
We're gonna be talking about how we're gonna be prioritizing our young people, but also embracing our multi-generational church. We are a multi-generation church. We have five generations that are represented in this worship center each and every Sunday. But we're gonna be talking about how are we going to continue to reach young people, amen? Okay, lastly, personal evangelism. It's in major decline. Nearly 47% of uh, the millennial uh, generation of Christians believe that sharing your faith is wrong. 47% of millennials who are a Jesus follower feel like if you share your personal faith with someone, that's wrong. But out of that same group, and this is what I don't get, but out of that same group, 97% of the millennial generation that calls themselves a Jesus follower, 97% say that it is absolutely imperative and important that someone makes a faith decision for Christ. Okay, let me think about that one just a... (laughs) What it boils down to is that spiritual conversations are difficult for some people. What it boils down to is that, that, that people may not have the tools in their tool belt to be able to begin to engage in, with people who are very, very different from them. It, it communicates to me that, that we, we have our faith that is inward and we're not willing to demonstrate our faith outward. What it communicates to me is that we struggle with sharing our personal Jesus stories. Every single person in this room that has said yes to Jesus, you have a personal Jesus story. And you have a story that needs to be shared and a story that needs to be heard from those that are far from him. So, we have some work to do. These are just a few examples of our present reality. And as we take a pulse on where we are at in our present, this should honestly turn our heads and our hearts towards heavenly wisdom, prayer, self-awareness, calling. We're gonna be talking about calling in the months ahead, passion, taking up the cross, embracing the mess. We have got to embrace the mess. People are messy. I can be messy. And I know you guys can be messy too. We have got to embrace the mess. Being willing to step into the unknown, live a Holy Spirit empowered life and remain steadfast in Jesus. So where do we go from here? Well, I wanna briefly go through this with you. As we close, I wanna take you to Revelation chapter three. And, uh, and this is going to be starting in verse 15. And I'm going to share very, four very simple thoughts with you out of this section of Scripture. So i uh, just give you guys a little bit of uh, context here. Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea, and, and it says, and, and, and essentially, I want you guys to understand this about the city of Laodicea. It, it is um, an economic powerhouse, Okay. Um, and they, they just uh, were generating quite a bit of wealth, um, and they had uh, produced medicine. Uh, they had uh, a textile industry that was happening uh, throughout the city, and this is what Jesus says to the city, and I wonder if J- Jesus would be speaking to us. I wonder if Jesus would be speaking to Spokane concerning this section of Scripture. It says here, starting in verse 15, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, 
gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. So just want to give you guys uh, these four important things concerning the church in Laodicea, and, and especially as it pertains to the reality check of our present. Number one is that Jesus rebukes the church for not being on mission. So I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So just give you a little bit of understanding here. There are two towns, one located at Colossae, which was located 10 miles away from Laodicea, and, and it was had plentiful cold water, just drinking water beautiful cold water. And then uh, another town that was located six miles away from uh, Laodicea, uh, they were famed for their hot springs that would bring healing power. And then Laodicea had lacked the ability to bring in water. So they had these like aqueduct systems. And, and so when, whenever water was brought in from either city, um, either the, the hot springs or the, the cold, refreshing water. It was brought into Laodicea, but it was, it was tepid and it was lukewarm. And so, and it was typically contaminated water, okay? So Jesus rebukes the complacent church for not offering life or healing. Jesus rebukes them for not offering life or healing to its community. So, number two, don't let worldly riches corrupt your spiritual lives. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Prosperity has a way of corrupting our faith. The church had become so influenced by a thriving economy and textile industry that they were so successful that they did not need anything from God. However, they did not realize, they had no self-awareness that their spiritual lives were in absolute decay. Number three, a call to repentance. I correct and discipline everyone I love. Oh man, Lord, that you would love us. Correct us, discipline us. It is actually one of the scariest prayers to ever pray. Lord, if there's anything in me, <laughs> correct it. The Lord loves you. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Indifference meaning your apathy. Your, your disinterest, your coldness. Repentance leads us to be reconciled and totally dependent upon God. He is the one who sustains us, amen? Last one, fourth one. Jesus always restores a heart that is willing. Jesus always restores a heart that's willing. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. He's saying, listen, the choice is yours. If you open that door, I want you to know this. I am faithful to come in and I am gonna, we're gonna have the best meal together just as friends, restoring. See. That was for the church. Oftentimes, when, when pastors will refer to that, almost that section of scripture as a thing of evangelism, but he's saying this to the church. He's saying, listen, knock. 
I'm knocking. I'm knocking on your hearts. Knocking. The choice is yours to allow me to come in. I'm going to restore you. I want to make you effective again for me. I want you to be able to pro- provide life and healing to the people around you. Jesus is talking to these believers, and God desires to restore us when we get off track. He really does. How many of you have ever been off track before? I know I have. And I need the Lord to discipline me. I need to repent. I need to realize that sometimes I'm off mission. And the Lord is quick to put me back on. Because in Spokane, 43% don't know who Jesus is. 43%. And I, as a church, and I believe as a, as a leadership team, we are called to make a significant difference in our neighborhoods for Jesus. To affect real change. And whatever, wherever you're at, whatever sphere of influence that you have, your neighbors, your family, your schools, wherever. So as we took time this morning to look back on the lessons learned from our past, we have an amazing godly heritage. I I want you to know this. I'm standing here on the shoulders of men and women who've gone before me. It is a real privilege and honor. I don't take it lightly. You are sitting in seats because of the amazing heritage of men and women who have gone before you. They were actually praying for you years and years and years ago. And we will see another generation continue to come and to serve I'm praying for the next 100 years for Turning Point to be the most successful next 100 years, reaching people for Jesus. Can you believe it? We'll be celebrating our centennial here in a short period of time. It's pretty amazing. And as we took time to get a reality check of our present, here's what's important. I don't want you getting stuck in what was or overwhelmed by what is. But God has always given his people everything they need at the time that they need it. Romans 15, 13 says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, he is our hope, will fill you completely with joy and Church family, I'm just praying for overwhelming joy to come upon this church. Not a fake joy, but an authentic, genuine joy where people are attracted not to you and not to me, but they are attracted to the joy of the Lord. That you be completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then, you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Next week, you do not want to miss this because I'm going to have one of our oldest uh, uh, standing members in our church. He's been actively uh, involved in our church in a number of different ways, but has been a member of our church for 72 years. 72 years. He's been here since 1950, and he's going to share about the hopeful future. He's going to take time to share a little bit about the past, but he has some words for us today as a church. But we're going to show that next week because I believe that those are some pretty prophetic words that we are to hear. It's important for us to take next week as, and mark it as a, as a priority for you and your family to come and be here. We're going to be talking about the church's hopeful future. 
in my sermon next week that we are going to lay out a few things that we are currently doing and a few things that we will be, be doing. But I don't, get, I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss this. You will be playing an important, vital role in the vision and the mission of our church. So I want you to come prepared next week. I want you to, become, I want you to come prayed up. And I want you to come ready and willing to hear. But then at the end of that sermon, I am going to ask you one of the most important questions. And this is the question I'm going to ask you. And I want you to begin to be, be prepared for it. Lord, what do you want me to do? The harvest is plentiful. And we are going to do some crazy out of the box things for the kingdom of God. Amen. And so I want you to come prepared and ready for that service next week. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? I'm going to pray a blessing upon you. And, uh, and, I, and I, just want to, I, I just want you to receive this as a blessing this morning. And, uh, and so uh, I want you to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. And I, I would love for you to just uh, put out your arms as a, as a sign of total surrender to the Lord. This morning, we come before you, God, and we just give you glory and we give you thanks for what you have done. Lord, we have a really amazing past. We have a beautiful history, and we give you thanks. We give you honor, Lord, that you have called so many godly leaders to this church, men and women who have served this church faithfully throughout those years. And Lord, today we stand knowing, knowing it was because of you working in their lives. And God, we give you praise and we give you honor for that. Lord, we know that we have some uh, reality check and some challenges of our present day. Oh man, God, we pray that we would be like the people of Issachar. Lord, that we would discern our current season Lord, that we would be mindful and wise. Lord, that we would not put our head in the sand and pretend that these things aren't happening, but Lord, that we would have the eyes that you have. Lord, that we would look through your lens, your heavenly lens. And God, as we take a moment and just say, God, we are excited about the future. In great faith, we believe that you are going to provide everything that we need for the season that we are in. And we pray, Father, that we would walk in your Holy Spirit and Lord, that we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we surrender our lives to you. With every head bowed and every eye still closed, I just wanna ask a really quick question to everyone out there. It's just a, uh, as a, a still in a, a posture of silence, if you are far from the Lord and you haven't said yes to Jesus and you would want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and make things right with God, you got stuff, you got mess, you got things that you're dealing with, and you're like, man, I'm so far from God. I've been running. I've been doing this thing on my own. And I'm tired. I'm tired. If that's you this morning and you want to surrender your life to Jesus and make him the Lord of your life, I'd love for you just to raise your hand this morning. Just in great faith, just raise your hand this morning. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I am so thankful that we get to say that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are so thankful that of what you did on that cross 2,000 years ago. And Lord, that you have given us a fresh start for everyone in this room that has said yes to you. Lord, we are so thankful that we've received your grace and your forgiveness. And Lord, that we get to walk it out each and every day. Lord, that we are no longer uh, uh, bound to the old sinful nature, but Lord, that you have given us a, a, a new and a fresh start. Lord, that we are a new creation in you. 
And Lord, I pray a fresh start for those that raised a hand this morning or those that are joining us online or those that said it quietly in their own heart. Lord, that they would walk it out. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, church family. Let's give God praise this morning.